to know about me, and it's kind of interesting for me going from Holy Spirit, come to us, to then we go to this like very practical, pragmatic video about observational science. I found that there's, in my experience with people, I find some of us tend to be more emotional, you know, in nature. Some of us can be more, I guess I'd say, pragmatic or practical in nature, very, um, you know, um, you have your week lined up. I have my dots in a row, you know. And, and I think it's good to, to view faith from both sides as well, to understand that, that when I'm approaching God, God does make sense, okay? But as I approach God, I also have to understand how that God who makes sense actually applies to my life. And so I, I, have, a, I have a passion for sharing God, like introducing specifically Jesus to people, but a lot of times I find there's many barriers that oftentimes stand between people, you know, really, truly embracing Christ um, because there's many experience that is, uh, experiences that have happened in life or maybe there's some just scientific, practical issues that stand in the way. And so um, for the next year, really, at Genesis, this is what I'm going to be doing is trying to find ways that we can, every week, we can have an, have an experience where we interact with God and we're kind of finding out how God's story Really, how really I'm really a part of God's story, if that makes sense, and understanding what that looks like. So in order to do that, um, I thought the best place to start would be to find somebody who's smarter than me. It didn't take me long to find somebody who's smarter than me. And then, <laughs> and, but I, honestly, I, I, uh, um, Dan Smith um, is a guy that I came across, uh, well, I heard his testimony probably was, well, it was a little over a year ago, it was more than a year ago now, um, but he talked about how for him, science was a reason he didn't believe in God. And so I was thinking, I was interested in, in hearing his story and how, how things turned around for him because I see him in church every Sunday now. And uh, I want to thank his wife, Vanessa, here for, um, for sharing him with us. Um, yeah, so, so Dan is a, is a member at Shepherd of Lakes. He comes to church every Sunday, but there was a time in his life where he did not believe in God at all. And so I'm going to let Dan share a little bit about that with you and how for him, and I'm not going to explain what, what he does because I, I don't get it. Um, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to let Dan share his story with you, and uh, we'll work through it. All right. Well, hopefully I don't bore everybody here. <clears throat> um, so I'll just speak a few minutes about, you know, my background. I'll tell you who I am and kind of what helped me get through, um, you know, my struggle with faith. So <clears throat> um, I've been a Christian now for a little over 10 years. Um, I'm a senior engineer at a large, diverse company. We make everything from appliances to car parts and everything in between. Um, I've led multi-million dollar projects. I have several patents or patent spending here and over in Europe. Um, and I'm often used as a resource because of my logical, um, very systematic, problem-solving approach. So I'm very data-driven. Um, you know, I, I like data. I love physics, thermo. Um, you know, all things mechanical in nature. So um, the reason why I tell you this is not to brag, um, but hopefully to lend some credibility to what we're going to talk about a little bit later. So um, growing up, I never really attended church, um, never studied the scriptures. We had Bibles always in our bedside stands, but we never used them. Um, you know, we attended church, or sorry, we didn't attend church, not even on the major holidays. It just wasn't something that our family uh, really ever did. So as I progressed through school, um, you know, high school, college, I was a self-proclaimed atheist. Um, really, maybe a skeptic is, is probably more accurate. Um, my beliefs were largely driven by what I learned in school. And uh, the curriculum and, and the teachers, they all reinforced that. So <clears throat> using what I learned in school, I was often really critical of Christians um, and all religious people in general. Um, specifically, I thought Christians were naive. Um, they had no regard for science. And, uh, you know, if evolution, you know, was the origin for humankind and that is taught as truth in school, then the Bible is not true. Um, so, you know, why would you believe anything else in the Bible if that first book doesn't mean anything. Um, around 2003, 2004 time frame, um, I began to realize there was kind of a void in my life. And uh, I, just, I wasn't really able to figure out on my own. Um, 
Vanessa, my fiance at the time, suggested that we go to church. You know, if we were engaged, we we're going to be getting married, and um, you know, she really wanted to be married in a church. We went a few Sundays, but that eh, just really wasn't for me. I was always trying to find an excuse to to get out of it. I'd rather you know go hunting or something like that. Um, and then you know, I had a good friend in college, and his dad. You know, they worked on me as well, and um, they were pretty blunt. You know, they just hey, you need to accept this and, and go to church. And, you know, they were successful. They got me to go a few times, but it just didn't really stick. So, <clears throat> you know, when I started my career, there was a gentleman that I worked with. Um, he was kind of a mentor. Uh, his name was Rob. He took an approach that really suited my way of thinking. He systematically and logically presented some facts and some arguments that really made me start thinking. So, you know, for instance, we talked about if how the first law of thermodynamics is true, then how did all of this come into existence? The first law of thermodynamics is basically one of the most basic laws that's taught in you know, physics, thermochemistry. <clears throat> and if energy and matter uh, can't be created or destroyed, only transformed, then does the theory, the theory taught in school really work? I realized that after you know, many discussions with Rob and you know, digging into some of those, that the Bible and science are really not at odds. <clears throat> So the way my mind works is it's hard to believe in something on faith alone. So show me the data, give me the facts, show me the evidence, and I'll make a decision. And I know there's a lot of like-minded individuals out there. I work with a lot of them, you know, as, as an engineer. And uh, I can tell you the data is there. In Matthew 7, 7, and 7, 7, 7 through 8, he sums it up. Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock at the door and it will be opened. I receive the Lord. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I was baptized and I've never looked back. We're all sinners, but we're saved by God's grace and we have the responsibility to help others by spreading the gospel. And this is a challenge because we as Christians, especially in an industry that's dominated by people that are not of faith, you know, we're going against the grain. So enough about that. Um, I'd like to talk about some science stuff here and what's really helped me kind of strengthen my faith. But before we do that, I want to go over a couple definitions that will maybe kind of help us as I talk through some of this. So the first one is, is science. Science is knowledge or the study about the natural world based on facts learned through ex experiments or observations. So you know, if you can create it in the lab or you can observe it, you know, that, that's really what it's, what it's all about. And then there's theory, which is an idea or a suggestion presented as possibly true, but that is not known or proven to be true. So evolution, for example, how humans came to be. That's a theory. It's not fact. And then there's a law, which is a statement of an order or relation or phenomena that is so far known as is invariable under the given conditions. What does that mean? Gravity. What goes up must come down. That's a law. And then scientific law is a statement that's based on repeated experiments or observations that describes some aspects of the universe. So a scientific law applies under the same conditions and applies the same casual relationship involving events. So first law of thermodynamics. You can't create or destroy energy and matter. You can only transform it. So as I mentioned that earlier, um, the first law of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy. So this combined with the conservation of mass is really where I like to start talking um, about how my faith, specifically in creation, is backed up by science. So these two physical laws state that the total amount of energy and the total amount of mass is constant. Energy and mass can be changed or converted, but it can't be created or destroyed. And then the second law of thermodynamics comes into play here, which is entropy, and it states that entropy of an isolated system never decreases. So what entropy is is disorder, so chaos. And the simple way to state this is nothing out there goes from order to a higher order. Everything always goes from order to disorder or chaos naturally, unless acted on by another power. So, you know, I use this as an example, and my wife can uh, back this up. The stack of papers on my countertop never stays a stack of papers for very long. <laughs> so we talked about a couple scientific laws. I want to talk about moral law now. Uh, and th this is another area where I really struggled. And what I mean by moral law is where do the conce concepts of good and evil, light and dark, right and wrong, where do they come from? 
And, <clears throat> you know, we all know that when someone dies, we're sad. If someone's murdered, it, it's bad. Contrary to that, we're all happy when new life is born or, you know, when good things happen. So why do we, why do we all have these moral laws that we share? Where did it come from? So what does all this mean? Well, <clears throat> as I thought about this, the leading theory of creation taught in schools, the Big Bang Theory, actually makes sense. But there's a few caveats from what the textbooks say. And you guys probably weren't expecting that from how I started, but let me explain. So if energy and matter can't be created or destroyed, and order naturally decays to disorder, then how do we explain everything around us? <clears throat> I submit to you that the logical explanation is there is a creator, God. What if he just spoke everything into existence? This is very similar to the Big Bang Theory, but it explains how the physical laws that we just talked about are broken. <clears throat> what science is really telling us here is in the beginning, God did create the heavens and the earth, as explained by the book of Genesis. And if something cannot be created from nothing, then also the theory of life um, just coming together by happenstance doesn't make sense either. And this ties into the moral law. If God created everything and it was good, then the concept of good and evil has been established by God. And I have a, a book here by C.S. Lewis that I want to quote because I think he sums it up nicely. And this is specifically about the natural law concept. It says, In the case of stones and trees and the things of that sort, what we call the laws of nature may not be anything except a way of thinking. When you say nature is governed by certain laws, this may also mean that nature does, in fact, behave a certain way. This so, the so-called laws may not be anything real, anything above and beyond the actual facts which you observe. But in the case of man, <coughs> we saw that this will not do. The law of human nature, or of right and wrong, must be something above and beyond actual facts of human behavior. In this case, besides the actual facts, you have something else, a real law which we did not invent and which we know we ought to obey. <clears throat> now, here the issue is, is that you know, the good we've tarnished with our sinful nature. And this is an example, again, of entropy, order going to chaos. And again, another quote from C.S. Lewis here that I, I really, really like um, speaks about that. And <clears throat> he said, God created things which have free will. This means creatures which can go either wrong or right. Some people think they can imagine a creature which was free but had no possibility of going wrong. I cannot. If a thing is free to be good, it is also free to be bad. And if free will is what made evil possible, why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. So, Today we've touched on a few scientific principles that support Christian faith. I want to make sure everyone understands something. I can't prove to you that God exists. But, likewise, atheists, non-Christians, scientists, they can't prove to you that God does not exist. The reason why I define science and theory up front is exactly because of that point. However, we can use science to support our beliefs in the Bible and that there's one true God. And this can help us defend our faith when confronted by non-believers. So in the end, we still need to have faith in God. Not just a few parts here and there, but all of it. And I submit to you, this is no different than the atheist or the non-believer out there. But their faith is just in something else. So I hope me sharing my story will help some of you. If you have you know, the same or, or similar struggles, or if you know somebody, um, you know, can reassure them that you know, there are other people out there that uh, struggle with the same thing. Thank you.